We've all heard the stories. Noah, the Sumerian accounts, the Chinese tales, those of the Native Americans, the Sanskrit writings, and more. We must begin with background information. If you didn't hear about Earth's weakening magnetosphere, it isn't for a lack of reporting. For years, we've known that our planetary defensive shield is fading. In the early 2000s, we had detected a 10% loss in strength since the 1800s. And in just the last 10 years, that number has raised to 15%. The weakening of our protective magnetic interface is hastening. It is fading faster and faster. It has actually been weakening since the 1600s. If you didn't hear about Earth's magnetic pole shift, it isn't for a lack of reporting. NASA broke it wide open in 2003, but since then we have seen that the poles are continuing to shift, the north more so than the south so far. But go ahead and watch the official motion from the WDC for geomagnetism in Kyoto, Japan. The north is on the left, and after staying in Canada for a long time, she's decided it's time for a shift, faster and faster. Point number one, the poles have begun to shift and the magnetosphere is weakening in a big way. As this occurs, one of the side effects will be less protection from solar wind, mostly hydrogen, and this ties into a hypothesis of the observers known as star water. Way above our heads, beyond the clouds, we find electric layers, the ionosphere. NASA has discovered that large coronal mass ejections cause these layers to erupt a significant amount of oxygen, hydrogen, meeting oxygen in an environment ripe for electrochemical combination. The hypothesis is moving beyond infancy, as it has been proven that solar hydrogen can liberate oxygen trapped in space rocks and still have the energy to make water in space. The particles would form hydroxyls first, and then water clump together, cool, and fall to Earth. Earth's erupted oxygen needs not be liberated from rock. It is free and ready to go. The hypothesis states that some of Earth's water had to have come in this way, and also that a weaker magnetosphere means more hydrogen influx from the sun and more water production, perhaps even partially responsible for those historical accounts of great floods. This was first shared in late July of 2013. Let's step away from that for a moment. NASA and other experts are gaining a clear understanding of how cosmic rays penetrate much more easily into lower portions of the atmosphere than does solar energy. The primary effect? Clouds, clouds, clouds. A tremendous agreement in some layers of the lower atmosphere. Our weakening magnetosphere will let in many more cosmic rays. And furthermore, it's now widely accepted that sunspots, or high solar activity, decreases cosmic rays. In times of solar quiet, see an increase in galactic radiation. As we look at the last 400 years or so of sunspot numbers, we can envision an inverse sinusoidal wave line that peaks oppositely of the sunspot numbers. This is the grand solar cycle. And according to the people who have correctly predicted the power of this solar cycle, we may be due for another grand minimum. With their models running, shows between 355 and 450 years between grand minima, like the Maunder minimum, with observational data falling in the dead center, 407 years. So counting back 400 years here, folks, here we go again. Here come the cosmic rays in force. In terms of star water, weaker solar wind with a weaker sun might make you think less star water production. But the CMEs are what do the most damage, and it just takes one big CME from one big flare or one big filament. With our weakened planetary state, everything could change in an instant. Last minimum saw a strong magnetosphere and a more stable magnetic pole so elements of a coming minimum would certainly be novel. Enough background. Here's the crux of the story. Another piece to the puzzle of water and energy from space. And it comes from some of the top scientists in China, working with some of the top scientists on Earth from the Max Planck Institute. They explain that during magnetic reversals, 
Earth's magnetosphere weakens and the solar particles pull more and more oxygen out of our atmosphere. The paper itself is about how the oxygen loss can cause mass extinctions on Earth, something already long ascribed to pole shifts for a number of reasons. However, it is the manner in which this oxygen comes out in the auroral wind, charged, seeking balance from the poles and the equatorial regions. And even with a potential return feedback on the dark side of the planet, it is the way in which this oxygen comes out that is important. Consider our background information. The weakening of our magnetosphere is already taking place. The polar shift may have already begun. And in addition to more cosmic ray cloud formation and hydrogen influx, we now know that more oxygen will rush out to meet it, all because of what we already see taking place. Now that the Solar Dynamics Observatory is in place, we have a new appreciation for the Leviathan eruptions on the Sun and the importance of Earth's magnetosphere. We've all heard the stories, not just of floods, but of the planetary orientation and chaos. It's now basic science. Who would have ever thought that the two were potentially so intimately connected? Who would have thought that a superflood may be on our doorstep? For inquiring minds that want to know more, you can search for Arc Storm on the internet. And for more on Starwater, please visit suspiciousobservers.org.